If there is one condition I would like you to really be familiar with, it's stroke. Diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, seizure, UTIs. Oh my God, I just mentioned if there was one condition. Okay, well, all right, so there's like seven diseases I would really like you to be familiar with, and it would be the ones that I just mentioned. For the moment though, we need to focus on stroke. This life-changing condition is a medical emergency when strokes initially occur. And depending on the deficits, it can have a devastating impact on a person's quality of life. I have here some celebrities who have experienced different types of strokes or TIAs. The first, for instance, is Frankie Muniz. He is from uh, the TV show Malcolm in the Middle. His first TIA occurred when he was 27 years old. It is of unknown etiology, but they do know that he was driving and he reports that his vision went blank and he actually couldn't see or speak. Uh, scary, but it went away and that's what makes that one a TIA. He has had several of those, but they still haven't figured out why. The next TV personality is Dick Clark. He is well known for hosting the New Year's Eve New Year's Eve party in New York City, and he preceded Ryan Seacrest, who now does it now. He actually had a long history of diabetes, and after his stroke, um, which he had a thrombolic stroke, he actually had to learn to walk again. And um, yep, I, I think he has since passed, but he had to learn to walk again because his stroke affected his mobility. The next person who had a stroke that you may or may not be familiar with is Sharon Stone. She actually had a hemorrhagic stroke and what happened in her situation is she was working out at the gym. Uh, she, is, she was about 40 years old and as she was doing some exercising, she then felt the worst headache ever. Come on. And that's actually a very classic report from a person who is having a hemorrhagic stroke. This is the worst headache of their life. The next person I'd like to highlight is Bill Paxton. Now he is um, no longer with us on this earth, but Bill Paxton, uh, as seen here in the movie of Twister, he actually had rheumatic heart disease, or I think they call it rheumatic fever as well, which in that disease, you have vegetative heart valves. And so he went in for surgery to try to repair and replace one of those vegetative heart valves. But unfortunately, during the surgery, he threw an embolism and he had what we call an embolic stroke or a ischemic stroke, which is type, uh, the embolic stroke is a type of ischemic stroke. Uh, yes, um, but I think we're going to learn a little bit more about why these situations happen and it can affect anybody and everybody. Stroke is defined as a change in the normal blood supply to the brain. This is problematic because brain tissue can't get oxygen or glucose or discard carbon dioxide and lactic acid well in the event of a disruption to the blood flow. Therefore, cerebral tissue can die within minutes of infarction. We may even have secondary brain damage after the initial insult due to brain edema and global perfusion. This is considered a medical emergency, the stroke is, I mean, and we must rapidly treat this patient to prevent permanent disability or secondary disability. Let's talk about the two types of strokes. First one being the ischemic. There are two types of ischemic stroke, the first being thrombolic. Thrombolic actually accounts for half of all the strokes that patients have. And the number one reason for this, atherosclerosis. In fact, we are gonna have atherosclerotic vessels that have these plaques all along the walls. And occasionally a plaque will rupture and the body will want to repair it and put a nice clot there. Well, if this clot happens to be large enough, it is going to stop blood flow to the distal vessels in the brain. 
And so on the outside of our patients, we're gonna notice their symptoms of stroke are very slow. Um, speaking about the onset of symptoms, they're gonna be very slow, and I'm talking minutes to hours. They're gonna be sort of progressive. The other type of ischemic stroke is embolic stroke. This is where we have a sudden break of um, sudden break of a clot from one area to, uh, and it's going to travel up the carotid vessels to the brain. Some sources of these clots or emboli are from the heart, actually. Maybe our patient has atrial fibrillation, which is a huge cause for embolic stroke. Huge, huge, huge. Also, our patient may have heart disease, as in my example of Bill Paxton. And um, we may have a prosthetic heart valve. If a person has a prosthetic heart valve, they are oftentimes on blood thinners for life. And if for whatever reason they have to come off their blood thinners, maybe a GI bleed, then they are the, uh, increasing their risk for stroke. Get back on as soon as possible. <laughs> Now, we also can have a mural thrombi. This is, comes from the endocardial lining, which usually develops after a heart attack. We can even have a clogged carotid artery where somebody has such bad um, vessel disease that the carotid arteries will just throw and shower little emboli right up into the brain flow. Not good. When somebody has an embolic stroke, if, this, if the emboli is small enough, we actually are gonna see all of our presentation of symptoms, but then they may resolve over hours or maybe even some days. We can also see an embolic stroke convert to a hemorrhagic stroke as vessels are gonna be now vulnerable to rupture from the ischemia. And especially if somebody has sudden hemodynamic changes like a rise in blood pressure. I am not gonna ask students to try to memorize all of the different types of stroke that are listed in a table, um, but I will say that the MCA stroke or the mid cerebral artery, artery is a commonly occluded vessel. So you're most often gonna run into an MCA stroke. The other type of stroke is hemorrhagic, as I previously mentioned. You can have a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a intracerebral hemorrhage. The subarachnoid would be the more popular of the two. However, in intracerebral um, hemorrhage, it is usually the result of severe sustained hypertension. And the bleeding is a direct irritant to the blood tissue and causes then additional edema distortion of brain tissue and displacement. We can even have herniation through the brain stem, and that is not good. Anytime a brain herniates, meaning it kind of comes through the bottom of the skull into the neck vessels, that's really bad. <laughs> if you ever hear that term, just know that's very bad. <laughs> Talk organ donation at that point. Okay, um, what is a cause of this intracerebral uh, hemorrhage, usually cocaine actually, cocaine use is a common cause in our younger people. And other street drugs can cause hypercoagulability, vessel spasm, and hypertensive crisis. Let's see, talking now more about subarachnoid hemorrhage, one of the reasons is called AVMs or arteriovenous malformations. This is where we have thin walled, no vessel network, and there's no tissue in between our vessels to help damper the pressure from the arteries to the veins. My picture there is of a patient who has a cerebral aneurysm. There's a bunch of different types of aneurysms. Once again, not gonna ask you to know the different types of aneurysms, but they can be very much genetic. So if somebody in the family has been known to have an aneurysm, you really want to make sure all of the children and maybe even siblings of that individual have been checked out, get a scan of their brain. Okay, 
Vasospasms usually occur in bleed strokes or hemorrhagic strokes, <clears throat> and they can contribute to secondary ischemia. Vasospasms occur in bleed strokes, and they can result in secondary ischemia. So if you were to do a cerebral spinal fluid tap on a hemorrhagic stroke, we would notice that it would be bloody because they're bleeding in the subarachnoid space. If I say somebody has a gradual onset of symptoms, do you think thrombolic or embolic? Right, thrombolic. Let's see, if I say neurological deficits are maximum at onset with paralysis, you then say probably embolic. Good, how about worst headache of my life? Mm-hmm, hemorrhagic, very good. When we want to understand what makes a person at risk for stroke, well, it's likely a combination of modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. I will mention that for first order relatives are the highest risk group, meaning if your sister had a stroke, you are more likely to have a stroke. Now, I will direct you to our modifiable risk factors, which are listed in a beautiful table on page 930, chart 50, no, woo, chart 45, two. So why don't you go and check those out to review what are the modifiable risk factors for a stroke. Now, remember how I mentioned for a hemorrhagic stroke, Aneurysms do tend to be genetic, so please encourage your person who has a hemorrhagic stroke due to an aneurysm to get their relatives checked out. So what does a stroke look like? We're going to begin to perform a FAST assessment. That stands for face, arms, speech, and time. And when I say face, I mean you're looking for asymmetry. Are they able to close their eyes equally? Can they raise their eyebrows equally? Ask them to scrunch their eyes tight, close tight as they can get it, and you'll notice that one side of their face is not able to um, close or have as many wrinkles as the other side of the face. Ask them to smile and take a look at their nasolabial fold. Is it uh, soft or is it well pronounced? Obviously, if it's softer, this means not enough nervation to that area to activate that muscle is occurring. When it comes to arm, ask them to pronate their arms and to hold them up. And pronate means their palms are facing down. But hold their arms up and close their eyes. And you're going to notice a arm drift. And if this drift occurs, um, that is highly suspicious for a stroke, especially if it's on the same side as the facial weakness. Now, speech. Ask them a few questions, such as, tell me your name. You know, you can do your level of consciousness questions. Tell me your name. Where are you? What day is it? What are, you know, why are you here? What are you doing? Hopefully, they can articulate all of that information to you. If they seem confused, or maybe they are so lethargic they can't do any of those things, we definitely need to get them to a stroke treatment center. Um, I do want to have you or a family member be sure to recognize not only the time of onset, we're gonna call that time zero, but do know that time to get the patient to a treatment center is also very critical. Let's see, okay, what else would I like to mention here about stroke? Um, our person can have sudden confusion, but I will say they may not. So don't say, well, they're not as confused, it's not a big deal. And anytime you have these symptoms as well, it can be uh, due to hypoglycemia or hypoxia. I will say that if the reason is hypoglycemia, check their sugar 
and if you note that their trigger is normal, obviously it is not hypoglycemia, and if it's hypoxia, you can look for those other signs and symptoms of ineffective breathing. Are their fingers blue, lips blue? Do they have symmetrical chest rise and fall? All right, and if our person mentions that this is the work he worst headache of their life, do think that it is a um, hemorrhagic type of stroke. We also may notice that our person's going to have in a hemorrhagic type of stroke, nausea, they're gonna have vomiting, photophobia, which means that they um, have like increased pain with light. They're gonna complain of a stiff neck. We are gonna see changes in middle status for our AVMs, arterial venous malformations. I guess you can see it in subarachnoid hemorrhage too. And in our ischemic strokes, whether it's thrombolic or embolic, we're really going to notice some motor changes and um, the fact that they're going to have that weakness. And let's see, how about that cranial nerve assessment? Well, this is extremely important to know when it comes to your interventions. Should I give this person aspirin orally? Mm, if they have a cranial nerve uh, that is being affected by this stroke, I'm going to actually choose to make them MPO and do the rectal route. A cranial nerve assessment is also important because you can help do interventions that are going to prevent aspiration pneumonia, um, such as sit them up, have suction available, maybe even constipation and dehydration because they are at now risk for that since they can't eat or drink or move. <clears throat> Do you know a history, uh, a health history is important to figure out, like, are they a smoker? Have they had TB shot? You know, what are their vaccinations up to date? But really what is most important, your number one priority is to get them to a stroke center. Ta -da! Or if you're in hospital, activate a stroke alert. Okay. This is also part of our assessment for somebody who has a stroke. They're gonna probably be in denial. That is a very common finding. And so when somebody recommends calling for help or getting an ambulance, um, having the doctor come check them out, you're gonna get some pushback. That is to be expected. And that is part of their mm, impaired cognition at the moment. We are going to notice, as I mentioned earlier, hemiparesis or hemiplasia. These are pretty much synonyms. They're the same. It means the right side of the body is going to be different than the left. In terms of sensory changes, if we have a right hemisphere infarction, we're going to see something called unilateral inattention or neglect syndrome. This is where they are really not going to pay attention to the left side of their body in terms of sensation so they're not going to be able to sense it maybe it's going to be numb and they may not even notice that they have a left side of the body <laughs> i know right let's talk about the cranial nerves assessment that i mentioned earlier so to assess somebody's chewing uh, we can actually have them clench their jaw really tight and you're going to put your fingers and feel the masseter muscle and see if it clenches and moves outward equally. This is assessing cranial nerve five. So have them clench their muscles really, really tight. Clench their jaw, I should say. Okay, to assess these cranial nerve nine and 10, the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve, um, we're going to be assessing their swallowing by having them open their mouth and say, ah, and we should see symmetrical palate and uvula rise. So this is to assess nine and 10, say, ah, good. To assess for facial paralysis, let's do that. Raise the eyebrows, clench their eyes, tightly close, smile. Sometimes you can even tell a person puff out your cheeks and don't let the air escape. 
And if you notice that they are not able to do that on one side, that lets you know they have um, a cranial nerve number seven be affected. Cranial seven nerve. Yeah, I think I said that funny. Okay, moving on. Check somebody's gag reflex. This one's pretty obvious. This is how you test <laughs> cranial nerve nine. So you're going to take your tongue blade and you're going to insert it back there and see if they gag on it. That lets me know if they are safe or unsafe to swallow. We should have an intact gag reflex. Last but not least, cranial nerve 12. This is assessing if they have impaired tongue movement and to test this, have them stick their tongue out at you, full, you know, stick their tongue out. And you can also ask your person to take the tongue and push it against the inside of their cheek, uh, like the right side. And you're going to push on their tongue. You're going to push on their cheek, which is actually pushing the tongue and then ask them to go to the other side of the cheek and stick their tongue into their cheek pretty hard, as hard as they can. And you're going to push as well on their cheek to see if their tongue can hold against your resistance. Now, if any of those assessments of the cranial nerves, if you identify impairment, you are going to call speech therapy. You are going to ask them to help you figure out what diet this person should be on. Initially, we're going to start MPO. And then once speech language pathologist comes, we may be looking at thickened liquids, maybe nectar thick, or you could go thicker as in honey texture. And if you really need it thick, it's going to be pudding thick. <laughs> oh, all right. So our patient is at risk for aspiration, pneumonia, constipation, dehydration. Oh, one more thing I want to have you do is a, a cardiovascular assessment for our per persons who have an ischemic stroke. We're actually going to have permissive hypertension, meaning if their blood, or blood pressure is 150 over 100, do not give any antihypertensive. This is a normal body's response to the uh, ischemic event and we actually need a higher blood pressure to perfuse around that clot and actually if we lower the blood pressure we're going to have a whole lot more damage um, to that poor little brain because it's not going to have blood flow that it needs so do not let the blood pressure get low on a ischemic stroke all right in general, you'll just want to probably remember which side of the brain does what. The right side of the brain is the visual con controls. They um, control spatial awareness, proprioception. Uh, oftentimes, a person is unaware of their deficits at all, so they have a little bit riskier behavior. They are emotionally labile. At one moment, they're crying, and the next moment, they're laughing kind of inappropriately. They do have an issue rep, uh, recognizing faces. They have poor estimation of probabilities. Um, in our left side here, they are language, uh, that hemisphere is language centric. It is very logical, analytical. It deals with math uh, skills, like you know, memorized skills. I love this picture. And yes, if you can see that phrase on the bottom, you do not need to know the stroke syndromes listed on that page down there. That's pretty advanced stuff. Here's a quick question for you. Let's see what you get. All right, did you get your answer? Here is the correct one. All right, Let's see what's next. All right, I want to talk to you about unilateral neglect, also known as um, neglect syndrome. Or as, excuse me, it's called unilateral inattention or neglect syndrome. This is usually associated with those who have strokes in the right hemisphere of the brain, which now we're going to have 
left-sided weakness, and we're going to have this unique syndrome develop. So what we need to do, because they don't see or notice that the left side of their body exists, and a lot of times they will have hemianopsia, where they will have blindness or inattention to one part of their vision field. It can just be in one eye, but if it's in both eyes where they have blindness in one side of their vision field, we're gonna call this homonymous, homonymous <laughs> hemianopsia. I know, I try to say that a bunch. So how are we going to move forward with our right brain stroke? Because they're not gonna notice the left side of their body and really doesn't matter uh, yes, it does actually, because now the left side of their body is going to be super prone to injury. And not only that, they oftentimes will get dressed and have um, only one side of their body get dressed. Or if they're eating food, they will only eat food from um, one half of the tray. They're not going to see or notice that the unaffected side, say, um, their arm is caught up under them or it's laying in an inappropriate position or that their um, sock isn't on that other foot and even that they still have more food to eat. How we're going to proceed forward is tell them to dress the affected side first, always. That is their new routine. So they're going to dress their left arm and their left leg first. We're going to teach them to touch the other parts of their body and to check often the placement. So is your hand, say, hanging over the bed rail and, and getting swollen, or is it sitting on top of a pillow as it should be? For the homonymous hemianopsia, we want to try to approach the patient as best as possible from the unaffected side as to not scare them. So see if you can try to request a room so their seeing side of their eye is actually facing the door so they can see you enter or exit the door. If you are talking about food on the tray, tell them about the items in relation to a clock. So your mashed potatoes are at three o'clock, your steak, well, meatloaf, I should say, Meatloaf is at nine o'clock and your fork is near the three o'clock. You know, that's how it goes. First thing we want to do after we determine that the person has had a stroke is figure out what kind of stroke have they had, because that is going to make us do one intervention over the other and determine that we can do that little bit of um, history taking, but a CT without contrast of the head is a really good way to rule out if they've had a hemorrhagic stroke because we might be able to detect the hemorrhagic stroke on that test, on a diagnostic test. So we've done a CT without contrast and we've determined that there is no bleed, therefore all of these symptoms must represent an ischemic stroke which by the way, if you wanna see an ischemic stroke on a diagnostic exam, you have to get an MRI, but those take like an hour to do. So time is uh, of the essence here. That's why we usually just rule out that it's a bleed. Well, oh, don't see a bleed. Looks like we're gonna do um, possibly TPA because it's most likely a ischemic stroke. Anyway, back to the show. All right, so we've noticed that it's an ischemic stroke and now we're gonna go ahead and mix up some tissue plasminogen activator or TPA. So about this TPA, it can be given to a patient if we know what time zero was, meaning what was the last time that they were known well. And if it happened at mm, 6 a.m. and here we are, it is 10 a.m. It has only been four hours, and because we're not greater than 4.5 hours, and we've determined it's an ischemic stroke, we can actually probably go ahead and give TPA. If it is greater than that, such as a person um, went to bed at 10 p.m., and then they woke up at, say, 5 with symptoms, when was the last time that they were known well? it was at 10 p.m. when they went to bed. So they would actually be ineligible to receive 10 TPA. So please make sure to know what time they were last acting well. And if they woke up with symptoms, 
It could have happened just before they woke up, but you don't know that for certain. And CT would not show that. Okay, um, there's other criteria as well. Here's sort of just some general criteria for TPA. We usually don't give it to anybody who is older than 80 if they have had an extensive history of strokes, like multiple strokes or uncontrolled diabetes. If their INR is elevated, such as greater than 1.7, so maybe they're already on anticoagulants, or if their NIH score is greater than 25, that means they have some pretty severe deficits. Therefore, TPA is probably not a good idea for this patient. When it comes to priority of care, we need to make sure to get informed consent. We, uh, as I mentioned, need to know the time of stroke onset or time zero. We need to insert two IV lines. The reason being is we're going to use one of them for our infusion and just the in the event that goes bad, we actually need to have an IV ready to go because we can't afford sticking the person while they have this TPA in their bloodstream. We're going to make sure that their head of bed is low if it's an ischemic stroke. Once again, that is controversial. I shouldn't say once again. This is considered controversial because data is a little ambiguous and if head of bed has much to do with outcome or not. But for most hospitals, if you have an ischemic stroke, flatten the head. And your primary role is to manage this patient receiving um, TPA, to give them a bolus and assess for changes in level of consciousness or your neuro assessment and to assess for bleeding. There's a pretty strict protocol for administering TPA. You're going to have to uh, review the protocol in the chart, but mm, review the protocol in your book because it's very specific. When it comes to medication management in our patient, we would love to give thrombolytics if they meet the criteria. However, there are other medications we're going to give, such as lorazepam or other anti-epileptics like phenytoin. The reason we give this is to keep the person from having hemodynamic spikes and from having seizures. This may be the case with somebody who has um, hemorrhagic stroke. We can also give calcium channel blockers. This is really good in our hemorrhagic strokes to prevent vasospasms in the, in the brain. One of the popular ones um, is called Nemotop. Or the other name for that is <clears throat> Nemotopine. Kind of like Amlodipine, but Nemotopine. Okay, stool softeners. We do not need a person to get constipated, which now we know they're prone to do, and try to push as they defecate because that's going to increase their intracranial pressure uh, just from the very act of pushing. And that Valsalva maneuver that they're trying to do is going to worsen our stroke. So it's kind of regardless of what stroke they have, we need to make sure to administer stool softeners. And when I personally administer stool softener, when was your last bowel movement? Today? Okay. Was it runny? No. I will, if they answer no, I still give them stool softeners. I usually only hold it, not if they've had a bowel movement already today, but I hold it if they have diarrhea because we want to stay, or stay clear from getting constipated. Now, for our patient who has the worst headache of their life, yeah, I'm sorry, we actually cannot give you narcotics. Typically, a doctor will just give Tylenol. Mm -hmm. So Tylenol for pain, obviously monitor their liver function. We are going to give antiplatelets. Uh, primarily, the drug that I'm thinking of is aspirin. This is going to reduce the platelet's stickiness. <clears throat> we should actually administer aspirin about 24 to 48 hours of stroke onset. Now. If they fail the swallow screen, please make sure to give them the aspirin rectally. If that person has come to the hospital and we've determined they have an ischemic stroke and they take TPA, we actually need to wait 
on our aspirin administration by about 24 hours of the TPA administration time. Then when that 24 hours is up, then uh, we're gonna give the aspirin. And the typical dose of aspirin <clears throat> is about 325 milligrams. So it's actually quite a significant dose. Anticoagulants is also indicated in some cases. So this, um, the, the drugs that I'm thinking of are heparin or maybe warfarin. This is if a person has, say, AFib, and we want to make sure that they don't throw another clot from their heart. The bad thing about this is it can cause re-bleeding. Or a new bleed. It can cause a new bleed in somebody's head. So we usually reserve anticoagulants um, unless it is absolutely necessary. And obviously, if somebody has a hemorrhagic stroke, you are not going to give an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet. That's really just for our ischemic strokes. I know you know that, but I'm just saying. We do have a few options if a patient is not a good candidate for TPA on how to alleviate some of the blood flow issues to the brain. One of them would be an embolectomy. This is actually the most successful um, intervention within the first eight hours of stroke onset. And what they do is they'll make a tiny little, um, I'm not even gonna say incision. So they insert a catheter into the femoral artery and they are gonna fish different instruments up somebody's uh, arteries actually. And they're gonna go right on up to the artery of the side where the stroke has been affected. And they're going to probably do a stent placement in the carotid artery. And they're gonna go even further to the brain where they're going to try to dissolve the clot by injecting little bits of TPA at it. And then they're gonna have this little basket or snare device and try to snatch it out. The bad side about this one, because there's always a downside. Um, <laughs> there is such a thing as hyperperfusion syndrome. And what this means is um, a person will then after the clot is removed and the brain is now being reperfused, they will actually develop low blood pressure and then high blood pressure um, they're going to have seizures and focal neuro deficits. Mortality, it's kind of, I mean, it's a rare condition, but mortality is high if they do develop re hyperperfusion syndrome. And our person, just because there's a risk for this, is going to be in ICU and closely monitored after an embolectomy. Now, uh, another procedure we can do is maybe not try to snatch the clot out, but just do a carotid artery angioplasty with scenting. And yes, our patient is still at risk for hyperperfusion syndrome. An endarterectomy is a really neat procedure. It's here illustrated on the right, but a person, if they have so much plaque in their carotid arteries, a doctor will go and make an incision from their ear all the way down to the clavicle, and then they open up the carotid artery that whole distance and they're going to scrape the plaque out yeah and then they sew the vessel right back up and they sew the skin back up so if you ever notice your patient a scar from their ear all the way down to their clavicle and eh, they've probably not been attacked it's probably an endarterectomy okay for our hemorrhagic stroke patients we can do a coil usually a person will have an aneurysm and we will insert also a catheter into the femoral artery, fishing devices all the way up to where their aneurysm is located. And they're going to deposit these teeny little coils into that aneurysm sac. And because the coils are now going to obstruct blood flow into that aneurysm, the aneurysm actually begins to shrink and get lower and lower, and it actually sort of collapses on itself. Those little coils remain in there for life. And um, this is a very important thing too. If your person needs to have an MRI, they are usually not eligible with the coils now being inside their brain. We can also clip a, uh, clip an aneurysm. That needs to be done usually by a craniotomy. 
and also something called a gamma knife. Uh, a gamma knife is where you use um, high frequency um, laser, I guess, to try to get rid of the AVM and to get rid of the aneurysm. But you have to do a craniotomy to do a gamma knife. Yes, high frequency. Uh, oh, I have that picture down here on the left. That is, I believe, a... I forget. What is that a picture of? It's either coiling or... I really believe it's coiling. No. <laughs> I wonder if they think about that. What is that a picture of? I really think it's an AVM before and after. That's real. Yep, that's it. Okay, it came back to me. That is what an AVM looks on an angiogram, like a cerebral angiogram. And then time passed, and then I did another cerebral angiogram three years later, basically. And it's gone. Amazing. Here's a question for you. Please pause. I'm about to reveal the answer now. There you go. And if you want the explanation of why this is the correct answer, you can double check the little note section in the bottom. I believe in our first or second slide, we talked about some of the secondary complications that can occur from a stroke. And this is actually where I'm gonna be discussing that. So the first complication is hydrocephalus or increased fluid in the cerebral spinal uh, cavity or sac, I should say, maybe. We're going to notice that patients are going to have behavioral changes, pup uh, pupillary changes, such as a pupil will be blown or excessively large. They're going to have poor coordination and reports of headache. We're also going to see a vasospasm. This is likely to occur in subarachnoid hemorrhages, and our patient is going to develop decreased level of consciousness, cranial nerve dysfunction, and aphasia. If this occurs, please make sure to give them that calcium channel blocker. Do you remember the name for it? Right. Nemotopine, also known as Nemotop. If our person who has coil placement, do watch out for a rebleed, which is likely to occur in about mm, 24 hours of placements all the way up to 10 days. In fact, a rebleed occurs in about 20% of 20 of patients. And um, what that's gonna look like is nausea, vomiting, and a severe headache. Basically increased intracranial pressure. Okay, so some of the main nursing interventions that you're going to be doing is making sure to uh, perform blood glucose checks. And this is honestly an intervention that you should do initially if there is any unexplained decrease in level of consciousness. If we have a sugar that drops down too high, hmm, that didn't make sense. If we have a blood sugar that drops down too low or if it goes too high, that can actually, actually be catastrophic to our healing process. And um, the simplest intervention is to try to keep their blood sugar in the ideal ranges. Well, what is ideal? For our stroke patient, we like them in between 140 and 180. 140 and 180. Remember those complications that I just talked about? Well, that is all about changing intra, um, our intracranial pressure on the inside. So what is gonna be the first sign of a change of ICP? It's gonna be decreased level of consciousness. And this is highly likely to occur in the first 72 hours. There's actually a chart with tons of signs and symptoms to watch out for. Um, some of them include severe hypertension, a widening pulse pressure. A lot of students don't really know what that means. That means your systolic is really high and your diastolic is really low. 
So it would be like 180 over 40 or 160 over 20, something like that. Uh, and bradycardia. In fact, if you do notice severe hypertension, a widening pulse pressure, and bradycardia, that's a real classic uh, syndrome called Cushing's triad. This means they have pretty severe increased intracranial pressure. So please make sure to report those vital signs promptly. Um, we're going to recommend, oh, as you see in my picture there, that is my dilated pupil. That's exactly what it looks like, really. One's normal and the other one's blown. <laughs> Um, no clustering of your activities. Try to space them out as best as possible as not to raise their ICP. And please make sure to hyperoxygenate before suctioning so we don't have a person hypoxic at any point in time. Okay, blood pressure management is quite the challenge. We don't want it too high for our ischemic patients or ischemic strokes. We do want a little high. Try to keep it between 140 and 150 for our thrombolic and our embolic strokes. Definitely don't want it below 120. And if it does get down there, you have to give them a vasoactive medication and probably transfer them to ICU. And for our hemorrhagic strokes, we really don't want their blood pressure high at all. Um, on the lower end is preferred. 120 is 110. Usually your protocol will lay it out for you what they want the blood pressure to be like. Monitor your patient for fever because fever will actually further extend the injured site and it can put them at risk for seizures. The next thing we need to do is aspiration precautions. Let's get a consult for speech therapy and our dietitian. Please ensure that your patient is MPO with your bedside swallow screen prior to any sort of, you know, PO things that you give them. We are uh, to plan on feeding somebody's gut, whether they have a food tray or we have to place an NG tube within seven days. If not, they're actually going to be starving. So try to give them food within seven days of the stroke onset. Daily weights and pre-albumin lab levels are very helpful too to make sure our patients aren't starving while they're on our floor. <coughs> Excuse me. For safety, let's make sure to have a physical therapist and an occupational therapist evaluate them. We may, uh, actually no, occupational therapist is probably going to place a sling on the effective arm for protection so it doesn't get rolled over or kinked or caught in something. And this is particularly the case if somebody has a right hemisphere stroke where unilateral inattention is likely to occur. A patient may develop agnosia in our right brain strokes. This is the inability to use an object correctly. And they will say use um, uh, like a key. And if you give them a key, they will not know what to do with it. Or if you hold a toothbrush, they're going to start dipping it in their water or trying to move food around on their plate with it. So um, if a person has agnosia, occupational therapy can help with this. <clears throat> and if a person has apraxia, this means inability to perform previously learned motor skills or commands. Um, like the example of apraxia is what you see below here in this picture. So you have a comb and they just don't know how to use it. It's beyond them. Mm -hmm. So if you can pair up apraxia, agnosia with unilateral neglect, it can pretty much leave a person partially dressed. Be naked. <laughs> and as you remember, we're going to address the unaffected. Uh, hmm. We're going to address the affected side first and encourage them to touch and feel the side that they keep forgetting is not there. Uh, how about getting a person out of bed? Should you get a stroke patient out of bed on their strong side or their affected side, their weak side? Answer is the strong side, always. PT can help with that. We're going to try to begin rehab ASAP. And the reason for that is your person is now very prone to have pneumonia. 
pressure ulcers and DVT. So move it, move it, move it. All right, positioning. Obviously, we're going to turn our person every two hours. We're going to avoid clustering activities, but I do want you to remember to avoid extreme necks, <clears throat> neck flexion and extension. Also, please avoid sudden hip flexion, as doing so is going to increase their intracranial pressure. Stroke patients do tend to slouch, to be honest, and they roll their head to one side like their ear will be touching their shoulder. So be looking for this. Don't leave them in that position because their cerebral um, spinal fluid and blood flow needs to be able to flow to come and go freely. I recommend propping their head up with a pillow and same for their arm too, if it's not in a sling. All right, seizure precautions. These should be implemented, um, especially if somebody has a hemorrhagic stroke. Mm-hmm because they're prone to that. So you're going to pad up the side rails, keep the lights low, low stimulation. You're gonna administer phenytoin, kind of the usual, have suction at bedside. All right, DVT prophylaxis, yay. Let's make sure our patient is wearing these and they're not just sitting on the floor or dingled over the bed, the foot rest there. <laughs> I know. And if somebody says, well, can I get the TED hose? Your answer is no. They need SCDs on. Now, would you put the SCD on the affected leg? Like the weak leg, the stroke leg? The answer is yes. Both legs get the SCDs. Good. All right. When it comes to the aphasic patient, because they're going to have trouble with their words, and pronunciations of things, especially if they have a left brain stroke because that is the language center. When I say left brain, you know I mean left hemisphere, right? Okay, good, just checking. Um, please make sure to allow for the slowness of their thinking. Um, they're gonna need help with memory. Please don't say, do you remember me? That's just kind of insulting. <laughs> um, try to make sure to keep regular routines have structure, and be repetitious in whatever you do. And by the way, this is a communication board, and this is essential for your person who's going to have um, the types of aphasia. It can be either used for receptive aphasia or expressive aphasia. And the way I can remember the two, sorry, the way I can remember two is Broca's aphasia is the expressive one, but think of your mouth as a broken motor. We, they can understand, but they can't get information out. They're oftentimes gonna have rote, uh, rote speech. And what is rote speech? It kind of reminds me of like a toddler talking, like I want water, I want pain medicine. They'll say, I guess, or yes, or okay. No, there's little fluency and variation of speech. They do get very frustrated and angry because they hear themselves and they hear themselves get it wrong, so just be patient and don't finish their sentence for them. In Wernicke's aphasia, this is the receptive type. I like to think of two broken ears for the two E's that are in Wernicke's. Yep, see, kidding. Um, usually, when they have this type of aphasia, they can speak somewhat clearly, but they're words are often meaningless and the patient will actually have uh, neologisms which is actually new words they'll make up new words i kind of do this anyway i don't know <laughs> but for them it's because of their stroke um, and for either of these strokes please have a picture board ready like the one i have here and oftentimes patients will have both wernicke's and broca's aphasia but sometimes one will dominate over the other. For our visual disturbances, please patch an eye for the blurred vision, uh, also known as diplopia. And if a person has ptosis where a lid droops, they may need taping their eyes at night and artificial tears so they don't have corneal abrasions. When it comes to home care, um, please no scatter rugs. Ask about those, encourage them to redo, you know, reduce it or remove it. Older people love their scatter rugs. Uh, reduce clutter, install grab bars into the bathrooms and showers, 
Um, they may need assistive devices such as a raised toilet seat that has arms on it they can push up and come down on. They may need, even need unique walkers. Some walkers will have a place where you can actually set your arm on rather than just grab the handle at the bottom. Family members need to explore options for respite care and uh, have that conversation because care caregiver fatigue is real. Please warn them about this and warn them about post-stroke depression, which usually happens at month three post the event, and they're going to get to a pretty bad low. Uh, don't be surprised if your patient gets on an antidepressant. Oftentimes, our larger hospitals will have a stroke center certification. Well, what does that mean? Well, this means that the interprofessional healthcare team is consistently delivering excellence and meeting core measures. And core measures, um, or meeting core measures equals better reimbursement for the hospital. And better reimbursement for the hospital means a bigger paycheck for you. So when you go out and look at institutions for employment, ask and see if they are a certified stroke center. And if they are, that's a good sign. It's a quality place to work. This list of items is really applicable if somebody has an ischemic stroke. <clears throat> this is basically a little bit of an example of what you should focus your care on as well as your documentation. You can stare at it for a little bit, but I don't think there's much more I need to say about it. Yep. This is a quick question for you to try to answer. Please pause, otherwise I am going to give the answer. All right, here's your answer. There it is. Whew. All right, blood pressure. Um, this is a slide discussing what we need to do for our aphasic patients. <clears throat> Please present one idea at a time. It should look like this. Um, let's go ahead and listen to your heart, period. Not, I'm gonna do a full head to toe, I'm gonna listen to your heart, I'm gonna check your legs out and see if your strength is good and look at your eyes. Like that is way too much for a patient to take in. So just present one idea at a time. And um, another example I have is when you're telling them to move somewhere, say, okay, stand up. Wait till they stand and then say okay grab here wait till they grab and then say take a step so wait for them to complete the first step before giving further direction uh cues give your person and teach them cues to give back to you so if they can't say yes or no tell them to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down Please avoid yes or no questions. Those are not helpful, especially if your person has rote um, speech, then you're always going to get yes or no questions and they may be even inappropriately answering what they really want. Use communication boards. That's your, that's your trick. As you leave today's lesson, please remember TPA is for ischemic strokes. There are different stroke symptoms according to the different hemispheres on where their stroke occurred. Bleed strokes can lead to a higher seizure risk and communication boards are helpful with aphasia, either type. That is all I have to say.